God does move in a mysterious way as wonders to perform, and we see that in history, but we also see that in each of our individual lives, don't we? As God works in sovereign ways that we had not anticipated, that we don't understand, that ultimately we won't understand until, this, uh, until glory, um, but we know that God is working to perform His wonders so that He will be displayed, that He would be glorified. Please turn your Bibles to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. We are just working our way through Paul's letters to the Thessalonians. And last week we looked at the first five verses of this passage of 2 Thessalonians 2, verses 1 through 12. And this morning we're going to look at the remaining verses. We'll look at verses 6 through 12. And I'm going to read the whole passage for context. So I'm going to start in verse 1, go to verse 12. We're going to see an amazing way how Paul is uh, comforting the Thessalonians' hearts that they could and should and must anticipate the return of Christ. The Word of God says... Now we request you, brethren, with regard to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to Him, that you not be quickly shaken from your composure or be disturbed either by a spirit or a message or a letter as if from us to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. Let no one in any way deceive you, for it will not come unless the apostasy comes first. And the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction, who opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God or object of worship. So he takes his seat in the temple of God, displaying himself as being God. Do you not remember that while I was still with you, I was telling you these things? And you know what restrains him now, so that in his time he will be revealed. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. Then that lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will slay with the breath of his mouth and bring to an end by the appearance of his coming. That is, the one whose coming is in accord with the activity of Satan with all power and signs and false wonders, and with all the deception of wickedness for those who perish because they did not receive the love of the truth so as to be saved. For this reason, God will send upon them a deluding influence so that they will believe what is false in order that they all may be judged who did not believe the truth but took pleasure in wickedness. Let's pray before we look to God's Word. Lord Jesus, You are coming back soon. And we long to see You. We long to see You either when we die and stand before Your presence or when You return for Your saints. Oh Lord, there are so many injustices in this world, so many things that just aren't right, that bother us. We long for your return to bring perfect justice. We long for your return to bring perfect righteousness on this earth. Yet we confess that who are we to demand justice when even in our own lives there are so many things that that don't display your perfect righteousness, Christ. So we long for your return, Lord Jesus, to burn away all the remaining sin in our lives. By your grace, may our hearts always be looking up in hope, always be looking in anticipation of your return. And may that perspective give us peace and hope in the midst of every difficulty, every struggle, every suffering. And may a longing for your return also give us perspective in the midst of life's sweetest blessings that you've surrounded us with, that there's coming a greater joy, a greater joy than we could ever imagine to eclipse every earthly joy when we're face to face with you. So we ask that you would use your word in our lives this morning. Open it up to us. Give us a a greater anticipation of your return, Lord Jesus. In your precious name we pray. Amen. Where is justice? Where is justice? How can our God be sovereign? How can our God be in control of of all things? And yet he seems to do nothing while evil is rampant, while evil seems to be out of control in our society, in our world. 
And although we live clearly in a time of increasing evil, we can know with confidence, with confidence, that God is in control. He is orchestrating all things after the counsel of his perfect will. In fact, we know God's word is very clear at the end. At the, at the very end, he will allow things to get much worse, much, much worse before Christ returns with full justice. So, Christian, you need not fear Satan. You need not fear that the forces of wickedness are in control or, and that they will win. No, one day our Lord will return. He will return, and he will make all things right. He will bring perfect justice, which means that you can trust him. You can trust him in the here and now, in the things that surround your life. We don't need to get worked up. We don't need to get frustrated. We don't need to get even angry when it seems that evil is, is winning. How are you doing as we go through a, a world that just seems to aggravate and bother our souls continually? How are you doing? How are you dealing with that? Are you trying to solve that within yourselves or within conversations with other people where you continue to complain about what is happening? Or are you looking to Christ and his justice and who he is to find peace in the midst of what we see around us? We can look forward with hope and confidence to Christ's return when he will make all things right for his glory and our good. And that's what we'll see in this passage. The key point of this passage is that God will, Christ will judge all wickedness with justice and finality. Christ will judge all wickedness with justice and finality. We'll see two key points to this passage. First of all, we will see judging the lawless one. Judging the lawless one. And then secondly, we will see judging all lawless ones. Let's look first of all judging the lawless one in verses 6 through 9. Now, if you've been with us, you know that in his first letter to the Thessalonians, Paul had assured them that those who died in Christ would be gathered first with Christ when he returned. And then all the believers who were alive at that time would be raptured to be with Christ forever. But then Paul became aware of another concern that they had, and that's reflected in what he says to them in the second book. Verses 1 through 2 of chapter 2, which we saw last week, he said, We request you, brethren, with regard to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering to him that you not be quickly shaken from your composure or be disturbed either by a spirit or a message or a letter as if from us what to the fact that the day of the Lord has come so apparently there had been some kind of forged communication maybe a false letter that had acted like or been written in a, a similar pattern as Paul that as if it was from him saying that the day of the Lord had already come Christ had already returned, and yet they were still there. They had missed it. And so they had nothing to gain, everything to lose, because they were being surrounded, as we saw in the first book, by, by persecution. They had great suffering, and they had been looking forward to Christ's return, and yet if he's already returned, we have no hope. We have nothing to look forward to. And so, Paul is correcting them. He's correcting that error. And we saw that last week in the, first, in the passage, the beginning part of the passage, that Paul said, no, there are two clear events that have to happen before the, the day of the Lord and his coming. We saw last week that it said, first of all, there will be a, a great apostasy. It's not that there will be a great revival and everyone will become Christians at the end. No, quite the opposite. It says that there will be a great apostasy before the second coming and the, the day of the Lord. Lord, Paul says that many so-called believers will deny Christ. They will show, they won't lose their salvation. They will show that they were never truly followers of Christ. They never truly knew him. And then last week, we also saw that there would be a second event. And Paul says that the man of lawlessness would be revealed. Other places in Scripture call him the Antichrist, the big A, Antichrist, the Antichrist. And this man, he's a real man. This isn't just some world force. This is a, a real man in the future. He will initially be a, a peacemaker. He will make a covenant with the Jews. Finally, it seems there will be peace in the Middle East. It's elusive, right? During our lifetime? No, it's never going to happen until at least this point. 
He will make a temporary peace with the Jews. He will sign a covenant with them. But then halfway through the seven-year tribulation, which the book of Revelation talks about in great detail, he will show his true colors. He will deny. He will turn against that covenant. And he will do everything possible to destroy the Jews and to destroy anyone who will not take the mark of the beast, to anyone who will not worship him. So this, Paul says, no, hasn't happened yet. Hasn't happened yet. You haven't missed the return of Christ. And as we talked about last week, this is a difficult passage to interpret. Probably one of the most difficult passages, uh, particularly of the epistles in all of God's Word. Uh, Many Christians, many Christians believe that Christ will gather his followers in what's called the rapture prior to the seven-year tribulation. And then he'll return seven years later in the second coming to destroy the anti to Christ and his followers. They would see this as a fulfillment of Paul's words in 1 Thessalonians 1.10 where it says that Jesus delivers us from the wrath to come. Other Christians believe that Paul gives these two indicators of the apostasy and the revealing of the Antichrist because they occur before Christ gathers his people in the rapture toward the end of the tribulation and then his second coming. But Paul's point in this passage we talked about last week isn't to, so that you can fill in all the blanks on your chart. The point of this passage isn't so that you can give an exact timing of the rapture. That's not the point of this passage. What's his point here? The point of this passage is you look at the, the purpose that Paul wrote this is to encourage Christians that they had not missed the coming of Christ and his gathering of his people together to him. So no matter what position you would hold, Hold on the rapture. It's the same encouragement. It's the same challenge for you to live in light of Christ's return. It's to encourage them that they, they hadn't missed the return of Christ and his gathering of his people together to him. Why? Because the great apostasy hadn't happened yet. Yes, there's, there's been small apostasy, but the great apostasy hasn't happened yet. The Antichrist hasn't come yet. And that's why Paul goes into detail in these passages, the passage we're looking at to describe the Antichrist, so it would be very clear um, that he hadn't come yet. To encourage them, to encourage us, so that we can look forward to when Christ comes back and gathers his people, so that we would live in hope. Beloved, so that you would live in hope of Christ's return, that that would give you perspective for everything in your life. But this passage also is very helpful for Christians because it helps us to deal with injustice. Look around our world, right? Horrible things that are happening. Horrible things in our world. Uh, And yet this passage gives us confidence. God is in control, and we can have confidence in our Lord's judgment of evil in perfect justice. So let's continue on in this passage. I just kind of review what we looked at kind of last time. Let's kind of pick it up there in the, in the middle of the, the passage. And we will see here that Christ will judge all wickedness with justice and finality. Let's pick it up in verse 6. Paul says, and you know, you know what restrains him, the Antichrist from coming. You know what restrains the Antichrist from coming so that in his time he will be revealed. Paul reminds the Thessalonians, you know. You know um, what was restraining the Antichrist appearing. You say, well, well, how did they know? Well, look at the previous verse that we saw last week, verse 5. Do you not remember that while I was still with you, I was telling you these things? Paul explained all of these things to them when he was there with them for those weeks or months when they first came to Christ. Now, in God's providence, we don't have a record of what, Christ, of what Paul spoke to them when he was there. We don't have that. We wish we did. We wish someone would have taken verbatim notes. Here's what Paul said. When he was there, it would have solved a lot, a lot of the questions um, that we have. But beloved, God didn't want us to have that. Otherwise, we would have it. We have everything we need for life and godliness. We have the revelation we need that God intends for us to have. Now, we can assume, we can assume that Satan would have liked the Antichrist to come long, long ago. 
Satan's not patient. Satan wouldn't say, okay, I'll wait 2,000 years or more for the Antichrist to come. No, he would want the Antichrist to come as soon as possible. Perhaps he would want the Antichrist to have come soon after Christ was on earth as one of Rome's emperors. Yes, there were many of them. All of them were against Christ, and yet none of them were the Antichrist. Certainly Satan would have loved them to come quickly or have some other murderous conqueror throughout human history like Genghis Khan or Lenin or Hitler or Stalin or Pol Pot or Mao or any other wicked ruler, um, earthly ruler. Certainly Satan was behind them and he would have loved to have elevated them to the level of what we're seeing here as the big A Antichrist, but he was never able to do that, even though those individuals uh, were very, very wicked. There has not yet been a one world ruler who makes a peace treaty with Israel and then breaks that peace treaty and sets himself up to be worshipped in the temple of God. That hasn't happened yet. Yes, many wicked rulers done many horrible things, yet never to the level of the Antichrist that it's talking about here. Well, well why not? Why not? Is Satan just inept? He can't figure it out yet? No, not at all. Who is in control? God, something is holding him back. Well, what is it? Paul says, you know what the restrainer is. Now, we don't have those notes that they had when he spoke to them, so we don't know exactly what it is, and there have been many attempts to try to identify what exactly is the restrainer that restrains the appearance of the Antichrist. But bottom line, bottom line, there's only one power in the universe that can control and hold back Satan. One power, and that's God. God. Our God is in control of all things, and He determines exactly what will happen, even evil. He determines exactly when it will happen. Psalm 115 verse 3 says, but our God is in the heavens. He does whatever He pleases. God is sovereign. God is in control. The man of lawlessness, the big A Antichrist, cannot come until God releases his restraining power. And in his sovereign plan that we can't fully understand, but in his sovereign plan, God allows him to come to the fore. That's why it says at the end of verse 6, so that in his time, he will be revealed. See that little word time? It's a timing issue. A timing issue. Now, when Paul wrote this, he would never have dreamed that it would have been over 2,000 years or more. We don't know how long. He would never have dreamed that. Not possible. In Acts 1, verse 7, Christ, right before he's about to ascend, what does he say? He said to them, it's not for you to know. That's a real good encouragement to us, isn't it? We always want to know. No, it's not for you to know. Times or epics which the Father has fixed by his own authority. Beloved, when we trust God that he has fixed, fixed all of these things by his authority, the times and the epics, it gives us great confidence. It gives us a peace. We don't have to try to figure out all the details because we know it's in the sovereign hand of our loving God. Nothing, nothing, not even Satan and all the, the powers of hell can do anything independently of God's sovereign timetable. They do everything exactly according to his timing. Remember when Christ first came? It, it very clearly says he was born in what? The fullness of time. And Judas and Satan were all involved in that, the crucifixion. Evil, wicked men were all involved in that, and God was sovereignly orchestrating all that. So also he will orchestrate this. Now this doesn't mean, now this doesn't mean, you say, okay, Antichrist hasn't come yet. This doesn't mean that there's no evil in the world. Not at all. Because we see in the remainder of this text, and we know the Thessalonians, they were surrounded by evil. Thessalonica was a very, very evil place. Even more evil than we can imagine. More evil than the, the world, the society that we're living in right now. Look what he says in verse 7. He, he gives them some encouragement to know, well, the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he's taken out of the way. There's a mystery of lawlessness. The word mystery here refers to something hidden which hasn't yet been revealed. In other words, it's unknown when the Antichrist will appear, when this lawless one will appear. That's unknown. That's a mystery. They didn't know. Paul didn't know. We don't know. But, but the lawlessness that he will be a key part of is already at work. 
The same lawlessness that will epitomize the work of the Antichrist was at work back in the first century, and Paul wrote that, and on through all the years of church history till today, the mystery of lawlessness is at work. So when you, when you look at the news, when you see evil things that are happening, basically it's just an expression of this. The mystery of lawlessness is at work. 1 John 4, 3 says, Every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. If you ever wonder, is this from God or not? Very clear. This is the spirit of the Antichrist of which you've heard that it is coming, and now it is already in the world. For the last 2,000 years of church history, Antichrist lawlessness that denies Christ is everywhere. We have that kind of lawlessness. There's nothing new uh, in our 2022. No, it's been always been, been here. But it's not your imagination, Christian. It's not your imagination that wickedness and evil seems to be getting worse and worse. Say, but John, isn't it getting worse and worse? Well, yeah, it is. 2 Timothy 3.13 says, But evil men and apostors will proceed, what? From bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. So it's getting worse and worse. So, so don't get bent out of shape when things seem to be getting worse and worse because God said it would. God said it would. As evil and lawlessness gets worse and, and worse, what does it point to? It points to the coming of the most evil human that will ever live, the, the man of lawlessness, the Antichrist. Ultimately, it points ahead to there will come a time when there will be the epitome of evil in one person. Verse 7, he says, The mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. So what does that tell you, Christian? There is coming a time when God will lift his restraining hand. We don't know exactly what it is that's restraining, but it's restraining. Satan cannot, cannot bring forth the big A Antichrist to dominate the world with wickedness like the Antichrist will do until God removes his restraining influence. And the Holy Spirit who convicts of sin and righteousness and judgment, there will come a time when he will not restrain Satan um, from raising up and empowering the Antichrist. And what will happen when God removes that restraint? Look at verse 8. Right after that. Then, right after that, then that lawlessness one will be revealed. The Antichrist will be revealed, whom the Lord will slay with the breath of his mouth and bring to an end by the appearance of his coming. When God in his sovereign timing removes his restraining power, then Satan will quickly, because he's been anticipating this, he's been wanting to do this all through history, and then he will finally be able to do it. He will quickly bring the Antichrist forward in diabolical world power. He will become a one-world leader like this, world has never seen. He will make a pact with Israel as if to protect them. The world will pledge allegiance to him. But halfway through the seven-year tribulation, he will reverse the peace pact he made with Israel. He will do everything possible to wipe out the Jews and any who will not take his mark and swear allegiance to him. And the Antichrist, he will have this kind of worldwide power for, for three and a half years. But then he will come to a catastrophic end when he tries to kill God's people and ultimately when he raises himself up to fight against God himself. Look at the end of verse 8. It tells you this unbelievable picture. Then that lawless one will be revealed. And what will happen? Whom the Lord will slay with the breath of his mouth and bring to an end by the appearance of his coming. The evil one, the Antichrist, who will try to dominate this world, who will try to get people to worship him as God. He'll be crushed by the appearance of the only one who is worthy to be worshiped. And this is such a powerful scene in this verse 8. We need to let God's word etch in our mind what Christ's second coming will be like. This is the second coming. The second coming of Christ. The first coming of Christ, he came in great humility. He came, he was born in a, a simple stable. He was in a manger. No one really, the world didn't worship him. Yes, some humble shepherds did, but the world didn't worship him. And yet when Christ comes in his second coming, it will be completely different. Let me read what God, how God's word describes this. Try the best you can to picture in your mind the second coming of Christ. Revelation 19, 11 to 16, and then verse 20. This is the apostle John speaking of, of what he sees, what's been revealed to him. John says, And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. 
And he who sat upon it, this is Christ, is called faithful and true. And in righteousness he judges and wages war. His eyes are a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems, many crowns. And he has a name written on him which no one knows except himself. He is clothed with a robe dipped in blood. His name is called the Word of God. And the armies which are in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, were following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword, so that with it he may strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. And he treads with the winepress of the fierce wrath of God the Almighty. And on his robe and on his thigh he has written the name, written, King of kings and Lord of lords. And then in verse 20, it says, And the beast, this is the Antichrist, and the beast was seized, and with him the false prophet who performed the signs in his presence, by which he deceived those who had received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. And these two were thrown alive into the lake of fire, which burns with brimstone. That's what Paul is talking about in 2 Thessalonians 2. That is the glorious return of Christ. Beloved, there's no battle. There is no battle. There's no extended skirmish back and forth. There's no fight at all. Game over when Christ shows up immediately and completely. Christ's glorious presence will immediately and completely overwhelm and conquer the most evil, wicked leader that ever existed and all the forces that are gathered together there with him to fight against God. It says the Antichrist in 2 Thessalonians 2, it says the Antichrist will be destroyed with the, the breath of Christ's mouth. Uh, Revelation 19, it's the sword of the Spirit. Christ's word is so powerful that his very word, his very presence immediately destroys the Antichrist and all those gathered with him. Shows the power of Christ's word. So the, the lawless one, the Antichrist, he will only come to, uh, to power when God removes his restraint and allows him to come to power. But then God has a, determined his time and authority over. He will be instantly and completely destroyed by our Lord's second coming. He will only ultimately have power for three and a half years. This is, a, this is a stunning scene, Christian. We need to reflect on the second coming of Christ because that's what Paul is pointing the Thessalonians to to give them perspective with the injustice that they see around them. Now, Paul continues in this passage with a, a further description of the Antichrist. So the Thessalonians would know, no, he hasn't come yet. Look at verse 9. That is, there's some more description. That is the one whose coming is in accord with the activity of Satan with all power and signs and, and false wonders. So when the restraint of God is removed, then Satan will put all his might in empowering this wicked man for a futile attempt to try to bring evil to a complete victory. And it says the Antichrist will have all power and signs and false wonders. The Antichrist will be empowered directly by Satan a powerful angelic being, a fallen angelic being. And if you read the book of Revelation, particularly read chapter 13, you will see an amazing descriptions of what the Antichrist can do. He will have miraculous power. He will even be, as it were, resurrected from the dead in a satanic way. All the power of Satan, all the power of hell will be focused on this evil man. And it says here in 2 Thessalonians 9 that his wonders are, are false. That doesn't mean they're tricks. No, they're really miraculous. They're supernatural. They're false in the sense that they represent and they point to a lie. A miracle is not necessarily a sign of God. The Antichrist will be able to do miracles in the power of Satan. They're false, his wonders, in the sense that they will support a lie. So we've seen in this, this first section here that Christ will judge the lawless one, the Antichrist. Well, what implications does that have for you? You say, I, I, I don't see any big A Antichrist. He's not around now, right? No, he's not. So what implications does this have for me? Well, there's a couple implications for you, Christian, today. One is, is that you don't need to fear wickedness. 
You don't need to fear wickedness. You don't need to fear evil. If you are a follower of the one true God, then you need have no fear that evil will have the ultimate victory either in your life or in our world. Now, it's concerning as you look around. Evil seems to be winning all around us. It could lead to fear. It could lead to anger. It could lead to frustration. But we can't let our hearts go there because God is sovereign. If God will conquer the most evil individual that will ever exist, then we can know that he's not in heaven right now wringing his hands. What should I do? Not at all. He is in control. We can trust him. Now, yes, God's people may very likely suffer great persecution. Believer, we live in in an anomaly historically and geographically, that we have lives that are so peaceful with little if no persecution. That's not normal Christianity. Yes, the Antichrist will put many believers to death. He will. And yet God will still be sovereign. God will be in control. God will honor himself and bring glory to himself even through that. And God will ultimately win. If our Lord will conquer the most evil, wicked ruler of all time, then, beloved, we can trust him. We can trust him with the evil that seems to be surrounding us today and just encroaching more and more. I think there's a second implication, beloved. You need to trust God's justice. Trust God's justice. We, we can trust his justice. We have a God that's holy and righteous and, and just with perfect wrath. Beloved, he will not let any sin go unpunished. There will not be any sin that's ever done in all of history that will ever go unpunished. Either one of two things will happen. Either that person will come to Christ at some point in their life in saving faith and trust in his death, and then that sin, that injustice that they did, will be satisfied through the perfect death of Christ on the cross. When he said, it is finished, he satisfied the wrath of God for all who would trust in him. Or, or, if that's not the case, then a person will suffer the eternal white-hot wrath of God forever and ever in a justice that our human minds can't conceive of. As humans, we would say, that's enough. But God's holy righteousness would say, no, it's not, because it's an eternal righteousness. And so, beloved, that should give you a peace. You don't need to take justice in your own hands. You don't. You don't need to try and convict people in the courtroom of your own minds. Or even as we're gathered, we don't need to try and convict people in the courtroom of our our conversations, judging people. Yes, we can talk about the evil in our world, but we must also always go back to the character of God when we talk about it, that He is in control. He is sovereign. We can trust Him. We can have a peace, beloved, when we leave ultimate justice to God. Christ will judge all wickedness with justice and finality. So we've seen, first of all, judging the lawless one. Now let's look secondly at judging all lawless ones. It's very easy to focus on the the Antichrist. It's kind of a, it's like, wow, talk about that. Wow, this is an amazing person. We're going to talk about that and how evil and, and how wicked he will be. And yet, this passage indicates that Christ's justice will affect all who won't submit to him. All. Not just the Antichrist. Look at verse 10. And with all the deception and wickedness for those who perish because they did not receive the love of the truth so as to be saved. With all the deception of wickedness. What is the deception of wickedness? Deception. Thinking like fishing, a, a fishing lure. I know a lot of you out there, you like to fish, and, and you're a very deceptive, deceitful person. You're trying to trick that fish that there's something good that it wants, and it goes for that bait or that lure, and it's hooked, and it leads to death if you don't let it go. Uh, and that's what this is talking about, deception, a wickedness. Sin is deceitful. Beloved, no one would sin if it didn't have some kind of pleasure that it promises. It's the lie that that happiness, fulfillment can be found in anything but God and His truth. It's the lie that the passing pleasures of this world can satisfy. Sinful pleasures can satisfy, but also even earthly pleasure, even God's good blessings, that there anything outside of God that can satisfy us more than God. Proverbs 14, 12 says, there's a way which seems right to a man, 
but its end is a way of death. People aren't following deception and wickedness and they're saying, oh, I know, I know this is wicked. I know this is going to lead to my destruction. No, they're deceived. Uh, no sane person willfully chooses a path that is painful, that is damaging, that is destructive. But when a person gives in to the deception of sin and wickedness, that's the path they're choosing. The Antichrist will have unprecedented power to deceive. He will deceive the whole world, will seek to follow him. He will draw people into wickedness. He will turn the world against God. He will turn the world to worship him rather than God. And that's why he says at the end of verse 10, Paul says, because they did not receive the love of the truth so as to be saved. I love this little phrase, the love of the truth. This is the only place in God's word where this little phrase occurs, the love of the truth. Why do unbelievers ultimately perish? It's not because they don't hear the truth. It's not because they don't intellectually acknowledge the truth. Jesus lived. Jesus died on the cross for sins. It's not that they don't acknowledge that. It's because they don't love it. Love it. So what does it mean to love the truth? It means to value the truth above everything else. It means to sell everything you own to buy the pearl of great price or the treasure that's hidden in the field because nothing is worth more than Christ. Those who don't love the truth, it describes the condition of unbelievers. They love sin. They love self. They love the passing pleasure of this life, but they won't love Christ and what he promises 1 Corinthians 16, 22 says, if anyone does not love the Lord, doesn't say if anyone does not intellectually believe in Jesus, it says if anyone does not love the Lord, he is to be accursed. Sort of anathema. Saving faith is not merely an issue of, of knowing or believing in a mental way. It's an issue of loving Christ, loving his truth. What did Christ say was the greatest commandment? To love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. The Antichrist, he will be able to deceive people with the lie that true satisfaction can be found apart, apart from Christ. And nothing could be more self-destructive. Nothing uh, could be more self-deceiving. You'll be able to deceive them. But God also will be a part of this deception. Why will the Antichrist be able to deceive people so effectively? Look at verse 11. For this reason... God will send upon them a deluding influence. Now, Paul's talking about the, the time when the Antichrist is seeking to deceive the world. God, God will send upon them a deluding influence so that they will believe what is false. In other words, this is all according to God's sovereign plan during the time of Christ, during the time of the Antichrist. Why will so many be duped and deceived by his lies? Yes, he will be very convincing. He will be able to perform miracles. But, but this text, why, what is one of the major reasons why so many will follow the Antichrist? It's because God will send upon them a deluding, deceptive influence. They read that and say, well, that's not fair. How can they be responsible if God does that? Now keep in mind that this is not describing people who, who want to follow God, people who, who want to glorify God, people who, who want to humbly look to God for help, but they just can't because God won't let them. That's not what it's talking about. No, this is talking about people who refuse to believe already. They've rejected his truth. They insisted on giving themselves to sin and giving themselves to earthly pleasures rather than God. And it says that God will then send upon them a, a deluding influence to settle them in that state. God's judgment will be giving them what they want. Prophet Isaiah talked about this way back in the Old Testament. Isaiah chapter 6, verses 9 to 10. He said, go and, and tell this people, keep on listening, but do not perceive. Keep on looking, but do not understand. Render the hearts of this people insensitive. Their ears dull, their eyes dim. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their hearts and return and be healed. Beloved, in the context of first, Second Thessalonians 2, Paul is saying that God will use Satan. God will use the Antichrist as instruments to punish those who refuse to love the truth. Proverbs talks about that, Proverbs 5.22. 
Proverbs 5.22 says, His own iniquities will capture the wicked. He will be held with the cords of his sin. The very thing that the wicked run after will hold that person. And this doesn't just happen in the end times during the times of the Antichrist. This happens today as well. Those who exchange God's truth for wickedness, they have no idea. Those that say, no, I don't want to believe that for right now. Later on, I'll turn, but right now, I don't want to believe that. I want to follow my own desires. I want to fulfill my own wants. I want, to, I want to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin. For now, those who exchange God's truth for wickedness have no idea that they are intentionally walking into a self-made trap that can destroy their souls. It's like a spider who spins a web and then somehow it's caught in its own web and it cannot escape and it dies. Remember back in Exodus 8-9, through 9, Pharaoh? This very much describes Pharaoh. It says that if you look at the text, he hardened his heart. He hardened his heart. He wouldn't listen to what Moses said. Let my people go. He hardened his heart. He hardened his heart. But then the text says, in chilling finality, it says that God hardened his heart. God hardened his heart. God hardened his heart. God hardened Pharaoh's heart in the choice that he had made not to submit to God. You harden your heart, that's your choice, but then there's a sobering reality that there will come a point when God can harden your heart. God can seal a person in their state of of willful rebellion. It's very sobering. 17th century English Puritan Thomas Manton said, the most tremendous judgment of God in this world is hardening the hearts of men. That's the most tremendous judgment of God. He hardens people's hearts in their state so that they are left to their choices. It's like concrete. If you've ever poured concrete or watched concrete being poured at the first, it's very pliable. You can form it, you can move it around, you can shape it, um, but very quickly it begins to harden. If you ever had a concrete job get away from you, it's a bad situation where it gets harder and harder and harder. You can't move it. You can't shape it. You just have to take a jackhammer and destroy it to get it out. But that's what happens to a hardened heart, where it hardens itself more and more and more. And when a person does that, God gives them to the hardness of their heart. And what's, so, that, so judgment comes in the inability to see the truth. It comes in the inability to love the truth. It comes in an, in an ability, it, the inability to trust God, where a person is sentenced to believing the lies that they've started to believe. And what's the central lie of all lies? It's to worship anything, to love anything more than the creator of the universe who deserves all worship, who deserves all glory, who deserves all adoration. At some point, At some point, God gives people over. Romans 1 talks about this. God gives people over to their sinful desires, not as a blessing, but as an act of judgment. And we see why in verse 12. Look what he says. In order. In order that they all may be judged who did not believe the truth, but took pleasure in wickedness. So what's this passage all about? It's about God's just judgment. It's very, it's very sober. There's a sure and certain finality here. Beloved, it's not just the Antichrist who is judged when Christ returns in glory to second coming. No, those who have followed his deception, those who have turned against God, those who have hardened his heart, their hearts, and then God has hardened their hearts, they will be eternally judged. Why? Because they refuse to believe the truth and instead do what? What does it say in the text? They took pleasure in wickedness. Beloved, what's, what's this all about? Pleasure. Where will you find your pleasure? Will you find your pleasure in the God who can only satisfy you in the way that he created you? Nothing else can satisfy you other than God. Or will you find your pleasure in the passing pleasures of sin and suffer the consequences, not just now, but for all eternity? The lie of the Antichrist, the lie of Satan, is that true pleasure can be found in anything other than God. What's God's Freeing joy. The Christian life isn't about no pleasure, no fun. No, it's the opposite. It's the greatest pleasure. God's truth is that true pleasure comes through loving Christ and His truth more than the passing pleasures of this world. 
Remember the prodigal son? He, he ran from his father. He, he spent all the, the inheritance that he had on the, the husks, the empty sins of this world. And then he's eating out of a pig trough. He says, what is this? But that's ultimately what sin is, isn't it? It degrades and degrades and degrades. So what are the implications of this second part? I think first is to consider the cost of the passing pleasures of sin. Consider the cost of the passing pleasures of sin. Are you believing the lie? Are you believing the lie that the pleasure of this world are more satisfying, are more fulfilling than the God of the universe and living for his glory? Is there pleasure in sin? Absolutely. No sane person would sin if there was no pleasure. But almost always there's a diminishing returns. The pleasure gets less and less and the cost gets more and more. But where are you at in that cycle? Where are you at, as you see, as he talked about the hardness? If you're here this morning, is your heart getting harder? Maybe you look back a year ago, two years ago, two years ago, my heart was much softer. You may be a young person. Very dangerous place to grow up in a Christian home, to be exposed to the gospel and the truth of God's word, and yet not come underneath that gospel. Very dangerous place. Because when he talks about hardening a heart, your heart can become very hard and say, I know all that. And then years will pass, and you, all of a sudden you realize, what in the world has happened? Why have I turned from true pleasure but the answer is always come to Christ now. 17th century Puritan preacher Thomas Watson said, What fools are they who for a drop of pleasure drink a sea of wrath? Did you get that? They, for a drop of pleasure, they drink a sea of wrath. And that's what all sin is. God has given us so many things to richly enjoy. And yet, beloved, even as Christians, we must fight the temptation to let any sin or even any legitimate pleasure to become more desirable than God himself. Beloved, what is it in your life that draws you away, even as a true Christian, that draws your heart away? What is it? For some here, this passage is a deep warning. No, there's no Antichrist today, as far as we know. Um, big A Antichrist. He's not here. And yet, you are in the middle of the same battle for your soul. You aren't being deluded by the Antichrist, yet you're being deceived by the lies of the enemy. You could be here this morning. You could even know a lot about Christ. You could even be claimed to be a Christian. And yet, if you've never truly submitted your life to Christ in faith and repentance, then you are on that deadly path of a hardness of heart. Hardness of heart. Say, I'll, I'll do that later. Be careful. Be very careful. How many people said, I'll do that later, and yet that later never came. And they, at this moment, are standing before a crisis eternity. Call this passage for you. If you don't know Christ, is to come to Christ, to believe that Christ is holding out to you the greatest pleasure because it's found in him if you will trust in him. And you don't have to walk down that path of trying out all the empty pleasures of this world promise. You don't have to go down that path. You can go down that path of coming to Christ in faith and repent. Repent. Repent of your sin. Repent of trying to find pleasure in other things than Christ. And repent of your self-righteousness. You can't be good enough to come to Christ. Cry out to him. But then there's also another challenge for those of you who are believers and want to glorify God. And what is that? Live for God's glory. Beloved, this passage is a, a sober reminder to all of us of the deceptiveness of sin and worldly pleasure. Even as a true follower of Christ, we can, we can wane in our love for the Lord. Does your love for the Lord ever get less than it was at other times? Absolutely, right? We all wrestle with that. We allow earthly pleasures. We allow earthly desires to dominate and become far too important. And that's not the path of pleasure. That's the path of sorrow, even for a Christian. We don't need to worry, beloved. We don't need to worry. You don't need to worry what you would do if you're faced with the Antichrist or some powerful world leader who's trying to get you to turn from Christ. That's not the issue that you're facing right now. What are you facing right now? It's the everyday small decisions of life. What is it that's dominating your heart and life right now? Even in this time of our worship service, what are those things that have tried to edge into your mind? Those things that have had tried to distract your thoughts? Maybe it's a person. Maybe it's work. Maybe it's a possession. I don't know what it is. What is it that's trying to distract you? What is it that gets you frustrated if you don't get it? Well, that's a dominating pleasure. Even as a believer, that God would have us to look to him. 
What are the earthly pleasures, the earthly activities, the earthly possessions that consume you? And they may not be bad in and of themselves. You don't just have to watch out for the things that are sinful, obviously labeled as sin. It's the things that are legitimate earthly pleasures that can feed, that can distract us, that can distract us. So, beloved, we must be ever careful to feed our love for Christ every day so that He is our greatest love, so that He is our greatest delight, so that He is our greatest joy, so then we can enjoy the other blessings to an even greater degree because we're not trying to get them to satisfy either relationship or possession. We're not trying to get them to satisfy what God never intended them to satisfy because when we're satisfied in God, then everything else we can enjoy richly for His glory. What is the distracting your heart from Christ? By God's grace, seek Him. Seek Christ as your greatest love, your greatest joy, your greatest light, delight. Turn away. Turn away consistently. Turn to Christ again and again and again. Say, no, that's a lie. Ultimate pleasure isn't in that. Even it's legitimate. Ultimate pleasure in you, Christ, and that I'll enjoy that as I enjoy you, Christ, most of all. So we've seen in this passage that there will come a lawless one, the Antichrist, that will be judged. We saw that first in verse 69. Then we saw that all lawless ones will be judged. And so, Christian, you can have confidence that Christ will judge all wickedness with justice and finality. The man's name literally meant someone who lives in a hut. Growing up, this man fought with his father. He fought with his teachers constantly. As a young man, this man struggled in secondary school. Eventually, he had to drop out of high school. Didn't even finish. At 20 years of age, he completely ran out of money. He was forced to live as a, a vagrant in homeless shelters. He was drafted into the army, but after a medical assessment, he was deemed to be unfit for service. And yet, this complete failure of a man will become one of the most powerful and notorious dictators of all time. Promising German, Germany redemption from the loss of World War I, Adolf Hitler came to power in Germany in the early 1930s, and he founded the, the Nazi Party. He rapidly set about rebuilding Germany's military in, def in defiance of the Versailles Treaty. I don't know if you know, there were over 42 attempts, some very legitimate attempts, some were very public attempts on Hitler's life. None of them succeeded. God was sovereign. God was in control. The Germans quickly took over Austria, Czechoslovakia, Poland, and then they rolled their way through Europe, crushing everything that stood in their way. It seemed like they couldn't stop. They would control the world. And Hitler, in that process, it wasn't merely about conquering the world. It was about unleashing unprecedented evil and wickedness in his quest for world domination. But a very obvious he is called the final solution. He and his evil regime intentionally and systematically killed over six million Jews. Tragically, God's chosen people. During his reign of terror, the Nazis built over 44,000 concentration camps, detention camps, prison camps, slave labor, and extermination camps for the Jews and anyone who would not, who would not follow them. By the end of World War II, it's estimated that the war that Hitler started caused the death of 70 to 85 million people. Horrible wickedness. At one point, Hitler very fittingly said, to attain our aim, we should stop at nothing, even if we must join forces with the devil. And they did. He most certainly did join forces with the devil in that wickedness. He also said, I will crush Christianity under my boot like a poisonous toad. The history cringes. It's, it's hard even to read of that, that part of, of world history. History cringes at the remembrance of Hitler's wicked regime, and yet, beloved, there is coming a, a future world leader who will be unimaginably more wicked than Hitler was. The Antichrist, though, will not rise to power until God, in His sovereign plan, removes His restraining hand, and then God will destroy him when our Lord returns in glory and majesty. So, beloved, that can give us complete confidence. That can give us complete hope, complete peace, no matter what we face. Christ will judge all wickedness with justice and finality. Christian, you need to have no fear. Ultimately, ultimately, 
even when faced by the greatest evil, the greatest wickedness around us. Why? Because God is in control. He is in control. And though things may get worse and worse, our Lord's glory and majesty will crush evil. And beloved, you can completely trust him. You can completely depend on him no matter what he brings into your life in the here and now because he is in control of all things. Let's pray. Doctor the Lord, though you're not facing the things that Paul specifically talks about here in 2 Thessalonians 1, and yet no doubt all of us have issues that we struggle with, with fear, anxiety, struggle. How would God have you to take these this passage and what it says about him and for you to trust and hope in him. Our Lord, we praise you that we need have no fear because we know how it ends. We know that you are in control, and ultimately this is always about how we view you, our understanding of who you are. And we confess so often we lose sight of who you are. We focus on the problems and the issues and the struggles in our life and the world, and it overwhelms us. And you just call us to look to you. May the, the truths of this passage and who you are, that you are a God of justice and righteousness, that it would cause us to trust you and to hope in you and to have peace in you. And that it would give us a confidence and a peace that the world can understand. And that would give us many opportunities because we long to take as many people as possible with us. That those who don't know you, we long that they would experience the grace, saving grace of coming to you, Christ, in faith and repentance. Open up opportunities the world gets worse and worse for us to share with many people. But that starts with us having peace and having hope. If we have angst and fear and, and great struggle and even anger, we won't have anything to say. But may we be so trusting in you that people will see there's something different and that you would enable us to give an answer for the hope that lies within us. In your precious name we pray. Amen.